come to order. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I apologize for the delay. Uh, Senator Hawley, the ranking member, will join us when he arrives. Um, and I want to apologize to our witnesses about the delay. As you know, uh, the full Senate today heard the articles of impeachment from the House. And so we were in our chairs to hear them. We're here today at this subcommittee meeting because a deluge of deception, disinformation, and deep fakes are about to descend on the American public. The form of their arrival will be political ads and other forms of disinformation that are made possible by artificial intelligence. There is a clear and present danger to our democracy. This world of disinformation doesn't have to be our future. We have agency. We can take action. And we are here today not only to hear about the dangers, but also to look forward to action that we can take in the United States Congress. But we should make no mistake. The threat of political de deepfakes is real. It's happening now. It's not science fiction coming at some point in the future, possibly or hypothetically. Artificial intelligence is already being used to interfere with our elections, sowing lies about candidates and suppressing the vote. We already have a chilling example. This January, thousands of New Hampshire residents received a call impersonating President Biden, telling them not to vote, not to vote in the state's primary. And it's important for the American people to hear exactly what was said. Yeah, participated in their primary. What a bunch of malarkey. We know the value of voting Democratic when our votes count. It's important that you save your vote for the November election. We'll need your help in electing Democrats up and down the ticket. Voting this Tuesday only enables the Republicans in their quest to elect Donald Trump again. Your vote makes a difference in November, not this Tuesday. If you would like to be removed from future calls, please press 2 now. It's important for the American people to hear what impersonation and deep fakes look like. It's also important to know that that's what suppression of voter turnout looks like. The deep fake of President Biden wasn't made by a computer whiz or some computer science graduate student or anybody with any particular skill. It was made by a street magician whose previous claim to fame was that he has world records in spoon bending and escaping straitjackets. The voice cloning technologies used in that call were inconceivable just a few years ago. Now they are free, online, available to everyone. And it's not just voice cloning, deep fake Images and videos are disturbingly easy for anyone to create. Protecting our elections isn't about Democrats versus Republicans. Already, deep fakes have targeted candidates from across the political spectrum, and no one, literally no candidate, no voter, no one is safe from them. And if a street magician can cause this much trouble, Imagine what Vladimir Putin or China can do. In fact, they're doing it. National security officials and law enforcement have been shouting from the rooftops, as well as in our classified briefings, their fears about AI and foreign disinformation. It's happening. It's here. Earlier this month, Microsoft revealed that social media accounts linked to the Chinese Communist Party we're using AI to meddle in American politics. China has been caught using deep fakes to impersonate Americans to sow division and conspiracy theories, such as deep fake images to push the lie that the United States military caused wildfires 
in Hawaii. Between the ease of use and the increasing interest from foreign adversaries and domestic political interests, our democracy is facing a perfect storm. When the American people can no longer recognize fact from fiction, quite literally, it will be impossible to have a democracy. As we discussed in our last hearing, these deep fakes and rampant disinformation are also happening at a time when local journalism is hanging by a thread. Deep fakes have targeted not only presidential candidates, but also Senate campaigns and local elections, like the recent Chicago mayoral election. Anyone can do it, even in the tiniest race. In some ways, local elections present an even bigger risk. A deep fake of President Biden will attract national attention. It will be publicized as disinformation and deception. But deep fakes on a local election, state legislative contest, or city council? Probably not. And when a local newspaper is closed or understaffed, there may be no one doing fact checking, no one to issue those Pinocchio images and no one to correct the record. That's a recipe for toxic and destructive politics. Congress has the power, indeed the obligation, to stop this AI nightmare. There are common sense, bipartisan bills ready to go right now. I'm supporting them. A number of my colleagues have offered and supported them as well. Senators Klobuchar and Hawley's legislation to prohibit deceptive political deep fakes, the Protect Elections from Deceptive AI Act, requiring consent and watermarks for deep fakes, such as Senator Coons and Senator Blackburn. It's called the No Fakes Act. On Section 230, Senator Hawley and I have a bill to ensure that there's no question that Section 230 does not apply to AI. We can hold social media companies and big tech accountable for election deep fakes and other AI-driven harms. If we leave them unchecked, deep fakes and political deceptions will sow the seeds of our destruction as a democracy. It may sound like an exaggeration, but it is dangerously true. And so this world of disinformation, poisonous lives, doesn't have to be our future. Today, we need to begin or continue the process of making sure it isn't our future. And with that, I'll turn to the ranking member. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this hearing. Thank you for being here. Um, All right. I'm glad we got that on the record. Um, thanks to the witnesses for being here. I, I just want to add, I don't really have much to add to, uh, to what the chairman said because I just agree with all of it. I think it's, this, is, this issue is, it's not just an issue anymore. It's not just a theory and, and the effect of AI in elections is not something, uh, deep fakes in elections is not something that is any longer just a theory. We've seen it. I mean, we've, we've seen it happen. I mean, some of you are here today to testify about it. We've seen it with fake robocalls. We've seen it with fake images. Uh, fake videos produced and disseminated on social media having to do with candidates. Uh, it's, it's happening on, it, it's not confined to one political party or to one primary. It's, it's happened uh, in, in multiple all across the country. And I, I think the dangers to, the dangers of this technology without guardrails and without safety features are becoming painfully, painfully apparent. And I think the question now is, is that are we going to have to watch some catastrophe unfold? Already we're watching Everyday people have their images stolen, have their likenesses used, uh, commandeered. We're watching uh, folks being, having their images taken and, and being turned into uh, pornographic material. We're watching news anchors have their images ripped off, turned into to false information, it, dubbing effectively things that they didn't say. We're watching the effect on elections. Aren't we going to have to have 
further disaster. We're going to have to have an electoral disaster before Congress realizes, gee, we really should do something to give the public some, some sense of safety, some sense of certainty that what they're seeing and hearing is actually real. Or is it, in fact, manufactured? And I think that is a, a baseline that we're talking about here. But I just want to, I want to echo and amplify something the chairman just said, which is that there are multiple bipartisan bills that are common sense bills that are ready to go. And I'm, I'm proud to have worked on them with everybody sitting on this dais, beginning with the chairman, Senator Klobuchar, who has worked on very hard on this. It's time that these bills got a vote. I mean, we can talk and talk, and nobody has done a better job of surfacing this issue and bringing facts into the public domain than the chairman has. But now it's really time to vote. And I just call on the leadership of both parties in the Senate, both parties. The leadership needs to support an effort to get a vote. And I say an effort to get, really, they just need to schedule a vote. Let's put these bills on the floor and let's vote. Let's not allow these same companies that control the social media technology in this company, that control the news in this country, that control the news in this country, to also now use AI to further their, their hammer hold on the United States of America and on our political process. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, again. Thanks to all the witnesses. Thanks, Senator Hawley, and thanks for your work on this issue. And I want to turn to Senator Klobuchar, who's really been a leader on this committee, the Judiciary Committee, but she also chairs the Rules Committee, which will oversee a lot of this legislation when hopefully it does get to the floor. And certainly we're here because we believe there should be a vote. And thanks to Senator Klobuchar for your leadership. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Hawley, uh, for this important hearing, this opportunity to keep this on the front burner. Uh, as uh, Senator Hawley just said, we cannot wait. Uh, we are scheduling a markup of our bill, um, and uh, we are going to have to work. It's the only committee that both leaders are on fun committee to chair. Um, and so I will seek uh, Senator Hawley's help and others on our bill. Um, which uh, includes Senator Coons and Collins, uh, Senators Bennett and Ricketts, and a whole lot more support on both sides of the aisle to get the votes, not just to, you know, we can obviously pass it, but I'd like to get a really strong vote coming out of committee so we can immediately uh, get this thing heard, because we really can't wait. The elections are upon us. Um, and uh, like any emerging technology, AI has great opportunities, but also significant risks. And this is the one right before us, as well as other issues related to scams, and we have to put rules in place, and we can't let the same thing happen as uh, every one of the four of us has been out front on this, as happened with uh, Section 230 and what happened when they just acted like these companies were little things in a garage, and now they're humongous monopolies, and now it's we are um, all challenged in trying to get these bills forward, whether it's on fentanyl, whether it is on, um, on uh, child pornography, uh, whether it is on competition policy, and we have to move these. Um, the fake robocall, I hadn't actually heard it myself, so thank you for that. Um, and it is just impossible to tell that that's not Joe Biden, as it was impossible to tell um, one um, video that ran during the Republican primary that wasn't accurate involving Donald Trump. Uh, that also wasn't accurate. Or uh, we had a uh, Elizabeth Warren video that, in which she says Republicans shouldn't vote. Uh, that wasn't her, but you couldn't tell. Uh, we had in Minnesota, and this is not AI, but it just shows how devastating this can be. We had a photo uh, the day after the uh, heroes, the two police officers uh, in Burnsville, Minnesota, were killed after rescuing seven kids, and then the paramedic was killed who was performing CPR. A photo of an actual rally picture from 2022 that I was kind of in the background on uh, started going around. Um, at the same time, there's some kind of Russian photo going around saying that I fund Nazis in Ukraine. That's been going around for three years. Um, this photo had a red circle around me in the background. And then they put defund the police signs in the hands of the people at the rally that were never there. So they were literally using the people who did this. I personally think it was foreign interest, but uh, took a photo and put those defund the police signs after these officers had been killed. 
And uh, the, to their credit, X and uh, Meta um, put altered content with the big sign, but it took us about you know, a day to get all this down. It was going all around the internet. That is actually not AI. That's a real photo and that they doctored. And people thought it was real. It looked real. And so this kind of thing is just going to keep happening and keep happening unless we take immediate, immediate action. Um, 11 states, uh, including my own, have enacted laws to address these threats to our elections. And that's great, but it doesn't cover federal. And so, and some of these states are, they're not all blue states, whatever, purple states. People are taking action as seen by the uh, bipartisan nature of our legislation. Um, and we also need disclaimers on other ads that aren't deep fakes, and that's a bill that we will also be marking up in the Rules Committee. Um, so I want to thank my colleagues for doing this. I want to thank them for their willingness to stand up on this issue uh, and look forward to hearing the testimony of the witnesses. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Klobuchar. Uh, I will now introduce uh, our witnesses. This panel is extraordinarily distinguished. So, hey, Ahmed is the CEO and founder of Resemble AI, a research and development lab focused on the creation of generative voice mo models. He and his team have spent the last five years developing and researching AI voice and detection technology and are uniquely positioned to understand both the remarkable potential and possible risks associated with the adva rapid advancement of voice synthesis and cloning capabilities. Rigel Gupta is the visionary founder and CEO of Deep Media, a leading deep fake detection and AI security company with a foundation in machine learning from Yale University and over 15 years experience writing AI algorithms. He has dedicated his life to developing Deep Media's patented AI technologies and establishing the company as the gold standard in combating threats posed by unethical AI and deep fake misinformation. Ben Coleman is the co-founder and CEO of Reality Defender, a cybersecurity company helping enterprises and governments detect deep fakes and data science for over 15 years. He has had 10 years at Goldman Sachs and Google. Uh, David Scanlon became New, New Hampshire Secretary of State in January 2022 after serving 20 years as Deputy Secretary of State. Prior to that, he served eight terms in the New Hampshire House of Representatives, including a term as Majority Leader before joining the Secretary of State's office. Uh, as is our custom, I'm going to ask you to stand and be sworn. Do you swear that the testimony you will give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Uh, why don't we go down the panel, uh, beginning with you, Mr. Ahmed. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Hawley, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the oversight of AI as it relates to the understanding, the impact the technology had to have on the election. Um, as I was introduced, Resemble AI is a research and development lab focused on the creation of generative voice AI. Um, we've worked with large media companies, game studios, uh, telecom companies, uh, as well as content creators to produce AI voices. And we've spent the last five years developing and researching this uh, voice uh, technology. We've created terabytes worth of uh, data sets that were uniquely positioned to understand the remarkable potential and the possible risks. And over the last nine months, a lot of the research we've opened up um, regarding uh, responsible voice cloning technology, including research on speaker identification, watermarking, and defect detection. Um, in my testimony, I want to share some of the technologies that we've developed since Resemble AI was founded, uh, especially around watermarking and defect detection, uh, and uh, share some of the recommendations I might have around transparency and disclosure, safeguards and mitigation, and integrity verification. Um, I'd like to pull up uh, a couple of slides just to uh, help the audience uh, just understand. Um, pull them up. Great. Sounds great. So 
before I jump into any of these uh, audio clips that you'll hear in a few seconds, um, I want to walk through how some of these AI voices are created. I think it's very important to understand how the technology works. Um, and, you know, we take a few minutes, seconds of audio. Uh, like Chairman Blumenthal said, it's super easy to create some of these voices, and these models have become widely accessible at this point. Um, we've always held ourselves to uh, exceptional standards of ethics, um, and we've developed many guardrails uh, since the inception of the company uh, to make sure that our technology is used safely. Uh, the first of which is a speak, uh, built-in speaker identification model, which we have open sourced uh, about two and a half years ago. Um, we actually use it internally to make sure that we get consent from every speaker that uses our technology. So there's no way any, anyone can basically go in, upload any seconds of audio, minutes of audio, and create voices from there. Um, we also have clear terms what you can and cannot use the AI voices from for. Um, so I, I'd like to play some of these audio clips in the presentation itself. Uh, maybe we can start with the, the first one on the left-hand side. One of these audio clips that you hear out of the floor is real. So we'll go ahead. This lively establishment now lay in ruins and its memories and stories buried under splintered wood and twisted metal. Uh, the second one there. A severe storm tore down the barn and scared the animals. Go for the third. Envision engaging your audience with dynamic, real-time conversational agents, effortlessly translating voices across multiple languages, and effortlessly crafting thousands of personalized messages. And the last one. The storm took everyone by surprise as it created chaos on the streets. So hopefully you can take a guess at which one's real. You can do it in your heads right now. We'll go to the next slide. The once lively establishment now lay in ruins and it's met. There we go. A severe Envision storm engaged in storm. There we go. Uh, the second one is real. So I'm not sure how many of you got that right. We, could, we can move on to the next slide again. Um, if you guessed incorrectly, you wouldn't be the only one. These, you know, as uh, Senator Blumenthal mentioned, um, these voice fakes, you know, the Biden one, we've heard him so much that, you know, you, you, you know what he sounds like, you could pick up on nuances. This was my colleague, <laughs> you know, so this was, um, these were all generated, well, three of them were generated, one of them was real, as you saw, um, and as you're all aware, this is happening in uh, much more frequency right now. Um, we acknowledge that the consumer education and awareness is a critical piece of addressing this situation. Uh, for the last 12 months, we've been publishing uh, detailed incident reports of every um, case where AI is utilized uh, for scams. We have analyzed the Joe Biden incident. Uh, last, uh, yesterday, we analyzed the last past CEO that was used as a deep fake incident on WhatsApp. Uh, so you have enterprises, you have consumers, you're all being targeted by uh, the widespread of this technology. And this is all available for anyone on our blog. Um, we can go over to the next slide. After creating and open sourcing um, uh, the speaker identification model, we then worked to um, create a neural speech watermarker as well as a deep fake detection model that uh, has 98% accuracy. Uh, we found that this is so critical that we've actually made the deep fake detection tool absolutely free. You can go to detect.resemble.ai and anyone could drag and drop any file, point to any YouTube link and um, figure out whether it's fake or real. Uh, we've also integrated into tools like Google Meet, uh, making it widely accessible. I want to jump to some uh, recommendations really quickly here. Um, first and foremost, we support the proposed legislation that requires clear labeling of AI-generated content. To wait, take it one step further, we propose there be a creation of a public database where all AI uh, or all generated election content is registered, allowing voters to easily access information about the origin, nature, of the con content that they encounter. This includes the deep fakes that may be out there. Um, we, to adequately safeguard against misinformation, um, particularly during critical events like election, collaboration is key. Uh, by distributing uh, and allowing platforms uh, or enforcing platforms to use watermarking technology or using deep fake detection will instantly tell the consumer whether something is real or fake. You won't have instances where you have to wait a whole delay while things propagate throughout the world and then you realize, oh, you have to like create community notes uh, to backstep. Uh, we believe that AI watermarking, watermarking technology is readily available solution. 
uh, that can already check the integrity of audio content. Uh, we propose that all election-related audio content, including uh, political advertisements, campaign messages, and public state statements by candidates be watermarked with the technology. Uh, one of the key aspects of our watermarking is that it can actually persist through training. So generative models, when they scrape data and train models, we can actually figure out from the output of the model where this data came from, which is significantly important. The traceability aspect is really important. Um, we also recommend the establishment of a certification program. Um, much like uh, you have the uh, check marks and you have e-signatures, setting standards for the effectiveness and reliability of watermarking solutions ensures that only trusted and vetted technologies are used. Um, we're always willing to help facilitate partnerships between private and public sectors uh, to ensure today's innovation is used responsibly. Thank you for the opportunity to provide insight into voice cloning technology and preventative measures that can be taken now to ensure the integrity of this year's election. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Coleman, and you can turn on your... Thank you, Senator. There you go. Um, ahead of my five minutes, um, we had a chance to work with um, Senator Blumenthal's office to record a few real and fake audio clips which would like to play for the group. Um, if we can start with the first one, we're going to ask the audience and those on the DS which ones are real and which ones are fake. Hi, my name is Richard Blumenthal, United States Senator from Connecticut, and I'm a diehard Red Sox fan. And the second one, please. Hi, my name is Richard Blumenthal, United States Senator from Connecticut, and I'm a diehard Royals fan. And the third and final one. Hi, my name is Richard Blumenthal, United States Senator from Connecticut, and I'm a diehard Yankees fan. And as you guys think about which ones are real and fake, we're going to share with you the surprise that they're actually all fake. And really, the challenge and opportunity is that anybody with a Google search and internet connection can make something as entertaining or as dangerous as they can imagine. Anybody ought to know I'm not a Royals fan. <laughs> no, no comment on that. <clears throat> with all due respect to the ranking member. Uh, Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Hawley, Senator Klobuchar, and committee members, I thank you for your stated concerns on the impacts deep facts have had on our elections and our democracy. And I thank you for holding this hearing, as well as requesting my presence here. It is an honor to provide insights that may help both your committee and the American people, and I applaud the committee's efforts in surfacing this problem in front of the nation. For three years, led by unmatched innovation in American tech companies, Rapid advancements in generative artificial intelligence are now a permanent fixture in society. As a longtime cybersecurity professional, myself and my team at Reality Defender foresaw the harms these technologies could bring years before the current AI boom. We built our company because after seeing how weaponized content and disinformation impacted our loved ones, we sought to combat the future technological drivers of advanced disinformation, which are called deepfakes. Now, deepfakes are AI-manipulated media that impersonate our citizens or create synthetic identities to spread disinformation or commit fraud. They hit the heart of what makes us human, realistic enough that even those of us who started AI for years and at PhDs have been at times unable to tell the difference between real and fake with our naked eyes. Now, not all AI technology is bad. Now, while they have their benefits, they can also hit core tenets we hold dear. We've seen foreign adversaries well, deepfakes in sophisticated disinformation campaigns with Russian media falsely depicting Ukrainian forces as the perpetrators of the devastating attack in the Moscow Music Hall. We saw this in America with the robocall of a fake President Biden to thousands of New Hampshire constituents asking them not to vote. I cannot list every malicious and damaging use of deepfake of the past, present, and future. What I can do is sound the alarm on the impacts they have, not just on democracy, but also on America. Anybody with internet access can create AI-generated audio, video, images, or text to convince and persuade millions of people. This fake media can be distributed and shared instantly over social media platforms. The more incendiary the content, the faster it spreads. Trust and safety teams at these platforms once blocked misinformation and fraud from spreading, but now the teams barely exist, leaving the onus of detection and verification on the users. Ahead of our 2024 election, also a year where two-thirds of the world will be voting in similar elections, 
We've seen the blueprints of deep fake fueled interference in Taiwan and Slovenia's most recent elections. In these cases, materials appeared and instantly spread to millions. The responses pinpointing them as deep fakes took substantially longer to spread. By the time the deep fake widely spreads, any report calling it a deep fake is also too late. Uncovering truth will always be slower and harder than spreading a lie. The same type of deep fake enabled operations can and have happened here. They will continue to be more damaging results as deep fake technology catapults ahead. This is not fear mongering, AI alarmism, doomerism, or conspiracy minded hyperbole. It is simply the logical progression of the weaponization of deep fakes. To protect our democracy and the media that drives it, legislation must mandate that content platforms are responsible for the urgent detection and removal of dangerous deep fakes and AI generated media. I applaud members of this committee on their Protect Elections from Deceptive AI Act. Unlike measures that have more or less given the pen to the largest content and social platforms, this law has great teeth, has a great start. But we can go further by imposing real penalties on bad actors using deepfakes to morph reality and on the platforms that fail to stop their spread. Federal laws should outline penalties specific to the severity of using deepfakes in election disinformation crimes as the state of Minnesota has done. AI developments move fast. Legislation must move faster. Forecasting and potentially anticipating the rapid improvements in the quality and application of deepfakes, all built by companies who move fast and break things. The things here are aspects of society everyone in this room holds dear. Democracy, truth, trusting your eyes and your ears. It's not a stretch to say that these are at stake when anyone can instantly create a deepfake to convince millions of people they're anybody saying anything. We must treat deepfakes with equal or greater importance than the worst kinds of content that existed before, before it, precisely because it gets the heart of what makes us human. We must, ask quickly, we, we must act quickly or we'll be taken by surprise by new attacks on democracy, on elections, and on the very concept of truth. Thanks, Mr. Coleman. Mr. Gupta. Senator Blumenthal, Senator Hawley. Senator Hirono, Senator Padilla, thank you for having me here. I am truly humbled to be here in front of you. My name is Rigel Gupta. I was born and raised in a small town in Oklahoma. I started building apps and websites when I was 10 years old. I'm a hacker at heart, but an entrepreneur by trade. I started building machine learning applications when I was just 15. I went to Yale where I studied machine learning academically. And after graduating, uh, after a couple of years, I started reading papers about what we now call generative AI. In 2017, I founded Deep Media because I knew deepfakes were coming, and I committed my life in that moment to solving the deepfake problem. Ever since then, we have worked tirelessly to make sure that people have technology to solve this problem. But first, before getting into that, I think it's important that we define what a deepfake is. A deepfake is a synthetically manipulated, AI-manipulated image, audio, or video that can be used to harm or mislead. This does not cover text, right? Whether you believe that human beings evolved over time or whether we were designed this way, the human mind is hijacked by image, audio, video. And that type of synthetic media content really has the potential to completely dismantle society. I'm not going to go into too much tech detail, but as legislators, if you're going to legislate medicine, you need to know the difference between Tylenol and Tamiflu, right? So I want you to keep three terms in your mind when you're talking about this technology. The first is transformer. It is a type of architecture. The second is a generative adversarial network, a GAN. And then the third is a diffusion model. Those three fundamental technologies are what generative AI is about. That covers about 90% of it. All of these models require massive amounts of compute resources and massive amounts of data. We're talking about millions of identities here. So just keep that in your heads when you're thinking about this technology. We've all talked about how deepfakes are coming and how they're basically here. Uh, but one thing that is, I think, hard for most people to understand just intuitively is scale, right? These deepfakes and these AIs, they're getting really, really good really fast, right? The quality is basically perfect now. They're getting really cheap to produce. Right now, it's about 10 cents per minute for video. That's going down to one cent really, really quickly. And the amount of content, the percentage of content that is on online platforms is approaching as much as 90% to 
by 2030, right? So we all know the harms. It's important you know the scale of these harms. Now, we've already seen them impact the elections, right? We have the deep fakes of President Biden announcing the draft, the deep fakes of President Trump getting arrested, the deep fakes of Hillary Clinton endorsing uh, Governor DeSantis, right? All of those are about political assassination. We are also seeing deep fakes be used to create groundswell support, right? The deep fakes of President Trump with black voters. So it's important to know that these deep fakes are going to be used for political assassination, but also for the opposite, to make politicians seem more relatable. But I think a bigger threat is actually not the fake content. It's what the fake content does to the real content, right? When anything could be fake, you don't know what's real anymore. And so we're going to start seeing plausible deniability come into play here, where politicians or anyone in business or anyone at all could just claim an image, audio, video is a deep fake. And that is fundamentally dangerous. People think that AI is going to be like the Terminator. It is much more likely to create a society like 1984. That's what we need to be worried about when we're talking about deep fakes. But in Silicon Valley, we like to take a solutions approach. So I am here to tell you today that solutions to this exist, but they need to have buy-in from government stakeholders, generative AI companies, the platforms, investigative journalists, even local journalists, and deep fake detection companies themselves. Those five groups of people need to work together to solve this problem. I am proud to say that we have uh, helped people like Donnie O'Sullivan at CNN, Jeff Fowler at Washington Post, and Amanda Florian at Forbes detect and report on deep fakes. We are members of the Witness Organization, an independent group that surfaces deep fake detection to reporters. We are part of the DARPA Semaphore and AI Force program that brings in researchers, corporations, and government resources to solve this problem. We are part of the Content Authority Initiative alongside uh, companies like Adobe that try to label real content and fake content. We also have several of our own committees that we're leading that bring in the deep fake generative AI folks to label their content, people in research for detection, and big tech platforms to adopt this technology to keep people safe. I am a believer in the free market. I fundamentally think AI can be used for good. I believe deepfakes represent a market failure. They represent a tragedy of the commons and that this fraud and misinformation is a negative externality and that if we legislate this properly, we can internalize that negative externality and make the AI ecosystem flourish. And with that in mind, I would like to take just a couple of minutes to show you how we can solve the deepfake problem. So I have a couple of slides that I'd like to show you and I want you to get in the mindset of how does an AI see media, right? That's kind of what we think about. We try and look through the AI's eyes in order to detect it. So again, if we can show the slides here on the screen. Go to the next one, please. Here are some examples of uh, what our system looks like. Again, we are mapping on the left there the proliferation of deepfakes over time, as well as the cost to society if we don't solve this problem. This is cost for fraud, uh, misinformation, uh, and other crimes, right? However, our platform can deliver solutions at scale across image, audio, and video. Next slide, please. Here we see what the, uh, some examples of real content and fake content. Again, it's not just about detecting a deep fake, right? It's being able to detect a deep fake while not saying a real thing is fake, right? That's critical. So our false positive and our false negative rate is very, very low. Um, and if we have a little bit of time, I'd like to show you just how an AI sees audio. We have some images up here, but on the next slide, we're going to see how an AI sees audio. And this is actually a real piece of audio. Here, that yellow and blue graph, that's what an AI sees. When it's seeing a person's voice and trying to learn from it, it's seeing that. And this is an example of our detectors picking this up as real. And you can fast forward through this. I don't want to take up too much time. But if you want to go to the final slide, that's an actual real political deep fake. Fast forward this one. The illegal Russian. This is a real video. We picked it up as real, right? And the AI is tracking the face. It's picking up certain key points on a person's face. And if you go to the final slide here. This is a deep fake that was produced uh, recently. Uh, and I, maybe we can just play the whole thing. Hi, I'm Carrie Lake. Subscribe to the Arizona Agenda for hard-hitting real news. 
and a preview of the terrifying artificial intelligence coming your way in the next election. Like this video, which is an AI deep fake the Arizona agenda made to show you just how good this technology is getting. Did you this is the highest quality deep fake made to date. Well, it is using months, detection or generative models that better. aren't By released the publicly. The they use their own detection or sorry, generation models that they created, hyper high quality, and we picked it up, right? So it's about staying on top. At Deep Media, we are both the cat and the mouse in the cat and mouse game. We have generative AI technology, but we don't give it out to people. We keep it internally and use that to train our detectors. And that is why we're here setting the gold standard. So I'm, um, again, honored to be here and happy to answer any questions. Uh, you all are the policy folks, and I am here to provide as much information as possible about what the solutions from a technical standpoint actually are. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gupta. Uh, Secretary of State Scanlon. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chairman Blumenthal and uh, uh, Ranking Member Holly uh, and Senate members uh, for the invitation to be here today. Uh, actually, Senator Padilla, it's great to see a former Secretary of State here uh, on the committee as well. On the weekend before January 23rd, when New Hampshire held its first of the nation presidential primary, Everything was going very smoothly. Uh, the candidates were out doing their last minute campaigning. Uh, all of the polling places were set up and ready to go. Uh, they had plenty of ballots and, and typical to New Hampshire fashion, we were ready to conduct a really good uh, election. Um, weekend went fine and all of a sudden on Sunday, uh, I started getting some phone calls from reporters asking if I knew anything about a robocall uh, that was taking place <clears throat> with uh, President Biden. Um, I went to bed that night wondering what was up first thing in the morning, um, we conferred with the Attorney General's office, and it was apparent that, that there was a robocall using uh, uh, AI uh, uh, with, Senator, uh, with President Biden's voice on it, asking uh, individuals not to vote uh, in the election because for Democrats, their vote was more important to support him in the general election. Interestingly, the robocall was uh, spoofed, and I understand that's a term where a call is assigned to somebody else's phone number uh, to a prominent Democrat in the state of New Hampshire who was a former state party chair and a former member of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, because her phone was associated with the robocall, she's starting getting uh, calls from acquaintances asking her to clarify what was being asked uh, in the robocall. She very quickly figured out what was happening and reported the incident to the Attorney General's office, and they opened up an investigation. Fortunately, when there is a major election taking place uh, in New Hampshire, uh, the media both state and national media are on top of it. They uh, are looking for something to report, especially when things are running very, very smoothly. And so when this surfaced, that they jumped all over it, um, which was actually an opportunity for uh, my office, the Attorney General's office, and the Governor's office to inform voters of what was occurring, uh, let them know that, uh, that what was being uh, said on the robocall was a form of voter suppression, uh, that it was illegal, uh, and that in that specific instance, they should ignore it and make sure that uh, they participate in the election. Uh, and every indication is that they did. New Hampshire had a record turnout in both uh, the Republican primary, but also in the Democratic primary uh, when you have an incumbent president running for a second term. Uh, New Hampshire broke a record in the turnout. So it is hard to tell how much of an impact that particular uh, robocall using AI actually had uh, on the voting population. Uh, we estimate, or the Attorney General's office estimated through the investigation that they have done to date, that there were between five and 25,000 calls made uh, in the state of New Hampshire to voters uh, with that information. Um, so clearly, uh, you know, it did not seem to have an impact on, on that election. Um, 
In hindsight, though, uh, looking back, the call itself was kind of primitive. And, and, you know, it is something that could have been done with an impressionist, somebody that could, a real live person that could imitate the vote of the president in this case, uh, and could have done the same thing uh, with a robocall. What was concerning was that the ease of which a random member of the public that really doesn't have a lot of experience in AI and technology was, the, was able to create uh, the call itself. And I think that if you add what happened uh, with video to go along with that, we saw some great examples here, uh, you could show candidates in c compromising situations that never existed. It could be a, a state election official uh, giving misinformation about uh, elections and, uh, and, and worse. And to me, that is incredibly problematic. Now, I know, you know, I know that there are instances where there's parody and there's humor, and I've seen AI with prominent politicians doing funny things. Uh, and it is funny, but it's also quite obvious. I think we have to get a handle on when an AI in elections is intentionally deceptive uh, and malicious. We need to be able to recognize it, stop it, and, and prosecute it. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of our witnesses for your really excellent testimony. Uh, Mr. Scanlon, uh, you hypothesize, as we can't know for sure, that the Biden deepfake had minimal impact, but we can't be certain what the vote would have been but for those calls. And uh, I understand there is an investigation ongoing. The Attorney General is conducting it. It's under New Hampshire law. I assume it's criminal law as well as civil, but there are no federal remedies. In your view, would it be helpful to have criminal penalties under federal law specifically aimed at this kind of deception? And I think it was Mr. Coleman suggested that criminal penalties could be an effective deterrent, but they have to be really more specific and stringent than they are now. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I have to agree that we truly don't know what the impact was uh, on the New Hampshire presidential primary. Um, uh, only, we only know that we had a good turnout and, and the results were what they were. Um, and we still have an active uh, prosecution going on. The AG uh, in New Hampshire has identified a company or companies that participated um, and an individual uh, that is a sus suspect and, uh, and they're move for moving forward with that. At some point, I believe that there is a federal component uh, to this uh, because uh, it's going to be a national problem. And I'd and I like to give a shout out to uh, uh, Kate Conley, uh, who works with Jen Easterly at CISA. Uh, Kate was in New Hampshire on uh, the day of the presidential primary and she traveled around uh, to polling places with me to try and get a handle on you know, how big this thing actually was, even though that was uh, difficult to determine. Um, but yes, I think that uh, you know, these things in a national election are going to be uh, generated nationally, whether it's foreign actors or uh, some other malicious circumstance. And I think we need uniformity uh, and the power of federal government to help put the brakes on that. Instances that happen locally, certainly government, federal government assistance would be helpful, but I think that should rem remain the prerogative of state law enforcement and the Attorney General. With assistance from federal authorities where it's appropriate, let me ask you uh, and the other witnesses, uh, Senator Hawley and I have proposed a framework which includes an independent oversight entity, a set of standards that would be imposed by that entity, a requirement for some licensing before models were deployed, testing to assure that 
they were safe and effective, just as the FDA reviews drugs to make sure they are safe and effective, and potentially penalties such as we've been discussing, as well as export controls to assure that our national security is protected. Uh, I'm assuming, just for the sake of speed, I'm assuming that all of you would agree that some kind of framework like that one makes sense. I actually have specific thoughts on that framework. I think it's a good start, but I really think it's important that whatever framework we set adopts a what's called a defense in-depth approach, right? So we need metadata, watermarking, cryptographic hashing, which is a little complicated, but it's invisible watermarks and a hash database, kind of like NCMEC, uh, AI detection, and AI poisoning. It also needs to cover both the generative AI platforms and the online platforms. We need both of those folks. We can't just say license generative AI companies and leave it at that. Honestly, we need government buy-in, generative AI buy-in, platform buy-in, journalist buy-in, and then detection companies. And all of those points are encompassed by our framework, particularly the watermarking. Yeah, I, I, I really think watermarking is getting a lot of attention here, and it really doesn't solve that much of a problem. You need cryptographic hashing invisible watermarking. That's really important. Mr. Coleman? Yeah, just to add on to that, and I think just to unpack two things here, we're talking about um, watermarking and cryptographic hashing, effectively uh, what's called provenance. It's either there or it's not. The, the challenge with that is it presupposes that everybody's going to follow the same rules. Uh, all the bad actors will follow the same rules, and we've seen time and time again, a lot of the applications, whether they're on your, on your phone in the app store or online, uh, or they're open sourced, they just aren't going to follow the rules. So we can't expect everyone to say, hey, we're going to play nice within this walled garden, when the bad actors, by definition, are not playing by the rules at all. And so you know, with Reality Defender, we focused on inference. We don't touch any watermarking. We don't touch any personal data. We actually assume we'll never see the ground truth. We'll never even know if it is real or not, which means instead of saying yes or no, we're taking a more measured probabilistic approach, a probability saying maybe we're 95% confident, maybe we're 62% confident, we build that into a larger framework of just one signal among many to make a better insight to have a platform or a team decide to block or flag a piece of media or a person or an action. We're going to hear, adhere to five-minute rounds on the first round. I hope to come back to this line of questioning, and I apologize that others of you, uh, Mr. Ahmed, you may have some comments as well, but in deference to my colleagues who have other commitments, I'm going to turn to the ranking member. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to everybody for being here. Mr. Coleman, uh, you raised in your opening statement what is, I think, my nightmare scenario, which is you made the comment that pretty soon it's going to be anybody with an Internet connection is going to be able to to access and use deep fake te technology. I wonder if we're there already, though. I mean, I'm looking at this article from the New York Times just a few days ago. The headline is, Teen Girls Confront an Epidemic of Deep Fake Nudes in Schools. The details of this are just unbelievable. I mean, this is this is a, a young girl, uh, Francesca Mani, at uh, a high school uh, in Westfield, New Jersey, and uh, she's a tenth grader. All of this is is uh, in the article. She's a tenth grader, and she found out that a number of boys in her class had used artificial intelligence software to fabricate sexually explicit images of her and a number of her friends, and then were circulating them. Um, online and you know showing them uh, to classmates, but but putting them onto platforms. Now I presume that these that these teenage boys didn't pay a lot of money in order to do this. In fact, the article goes on to say that they used uh, widely available nudification apps to create these fake photos. So they take the, the the photos of their classmates from you know Instagram or wherever, and uh, uh, use those, feed them into this app, and, and then here you are, and it probably costs them almost nothing. So I guess my question to you is, are we at the point now with this technology where we're going to see a flood of uh, AI-generated CSAM, a, a flood of um, other uh, sexually explicit uh, material created of adults or, or young adults? I mean, is, is this the point that we're at now? Ranking Member Holly, we were at that point six months ago. And the challenge for us right now is where the U.S. is leading the development of a lot of these novel technological tools. We're not leading in regulations to protect from these tools. We have Taiwan, we have Singapore, we even have China with more advanced regulations in this space. And to your point, beyond elections, thinking about different types of kind of uh, equally or more dangerous risks from deepfakes, there was recently a House Oversight and Accountability Committee referencing 
very scary statistics that 98% of all deepfakes are actually pornographic. 99%. Sorry, what was the percentage? 98% of all deepfakes. 99% of people targeting deepfakes are women. Um, the 40 most popular deepfake pornography websites have over 143,000 deepfakes pornography, unpermissioned, just in the last year, getting over 4 billion views. Now, these two numbers are more than the previous 10 years combined. So when I say this is already a problem, it's been a problem. We're waking up to it now, and the selection is just one risk that the larger world of regulations can solve for. So I guess my question is, I mean, given that, what, what is the most effective regulatory avenues to pursue? I mean, how, how are we going to empower people like Francesca and her parents and the hundreds of thousands? I mean, is it soon going to be millions of women who have had their images uh, used, you know, commandeered, we'd say in a legal sense, and, and turned into uh, this sexually explicit material? How, how are we going to empower them? You know, it's quite simple. You mentioned CSAM imagery. There's a really nice framework in both national and also state-level regulations in the space. When you upload something on, for example, YouTube, it's checking for a few things. It's checking for violence. It's checking for underage imagery. It's checking for, are you uploading the latest Drake song? That's because of regulations. So to scan for generative media would just be another check within that same flow. It's nothing new, nothing novel. It just needs your teams to actually push it forward to acquire the platforms to protect the consumers. Because in the absence of this, we have things like community notes, which only actually cause anything once things have been shared 100 million times. Or worse than that, we have content moderation teams, which we've seen be slashed, and they don't really do anything at all. So the challenge here right now is that the technology exists. We have folks on this DS who can actually solve for it. We need regulations to acquire the platforms themselves to use us the same way they're required to scan for underage imagery. Sorry, really quick, a point on sure. that. I think it's important to understand that for like a deep nude image, they're shared on like WhatsApp and things like that. Those are end-to-end -end encrypted. You can't, you can't detect that. It doesn't make any sense. To solve that specific deep nude, you need AI poisoning, which is part of the defense in depth. Anytime you upload an image to Instagram, you can poison it so that if someone tries to deep nude it, it turns out as garbage. So for specifically for deep nudes of like images posted to Instagram, AI poisoning is that solution. Yeah, and you know, I hear what you're saying. I mean, all of that sounds good, and I hear what you're saying about the, the platform's current obligations uh, and their, their current uh, rules that they have in place, for instance, to detect CSAM and so forth. But the problem is, is that this committee and other committees have heard mountainous evidence that these same platforms are absolutely awash in CSAM that is not digitally created, it's not synthetic, it, it is, you know, quote unquote, I mean, real, it's, it's actual people, which is even worse. And it, I mean, they're just absolutely, they, they say that they're trying to do their best, but it is absolutely the internet, particularly Facebook, Instagram, absolutely overrun. Which brings me to what I think has got to be part of this conversation is we have got to allow Americans, ordinary Americans, individual citizens, we have got to allow them to get into court and to hold accountable legally companies who are producing or hosting this content. I, I, if we don't do that, I don't see how we change the incentive structure. If Instagram fears that it's gonna get a billion dollar jury verdict against it, they'll adopt all kinds of new technology. But if they don't, they won't. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Hawley. Senator Klobuchar. So true, Senator Hawley. Um, uh, right now I'm going to focus on elections, but I will say those were startling numbers, Mr. Coleman, and uh, I think it is just what we are seeing, both real people and AI-created people. It's one of the reasons that we got the SHIELD Act through here, which is not the liability issue that I also support that Senator Hawley was mentioning, but also um, getting the information to law enforcement um, and, and the like to be able to um, make it easier to go after these perpetrators. Um, and if we can just sit here and do nothing. We can pass resolutions. We can, but unless we empower um, people to go after these cases and then equally make liability, it's just going to get worse and worse. Um, and at some point, the public will have had it. Um, I don't know if that's what this year, but it's going to happen. And so I keep telling my colleagues this. Um, so let's go to a few things here. Um, the, the bill that I mentioned that Senator Hawley and Coons and Collins and Bennett Ricketts, other I have, um, could you tell me, Mr. Coleman, how 
um, AI has this potential to turbocharge election-related disinformation and why we can't just rely on um, the um, disclaimers and watermarks. I think you can do that for a set of it. I don't think you should do it for all uses of AI. And um, we have a labeling bill that I think dis differentiates that. But for this really bad stuff uh, that Secretary of State Scanlon was referring to, um, tell us why it's not enough, this is softball, but to run a whole thing and have a little label at the underneath when they think it's the actual candidate, but it's not. So. You know, we, we agree on that. I think that to paint the larger picture, what we saw uh, during the primaries was a uh, single static deep fake pre-recorded, kind of a one-to-many attack. It didn't change. It wasn't even live. Imagine a world where that was a one-to-one uh, -one attack where instead of it being pre-recorded, it was actually live. And instead of being from one to many, it was one to one, where it's coming from your husband, your wife, your boss, saying, hey, Ben, we need you in the office at 6 a.m. I know it's a voting day. Uh, or to, to an election official, hey, we're moving your precinct. We need you to be across town three hours away. And so that's where this is going to go. It's not going to be a single pre-recorded, you know, arguably medium-level deepfake. It's going to be a real-time custom deepfake in conversational language having people do all kinds of things at all levels of the election, uh, uh, election system. So on our side, we see this as a massive issue, not just in the US, but globally. And what's great here is on the DS, we have different technologies all solving very much the same issue. It's all possible now. We have large companies. We work with large banks, large government groups, large media organizations that are thinking long term and already solving for this. We have banks scanning incoming phone calls, every single phone call. We don't have anyone protecting average consumers. My parents, uh, my grandparents, mm -hmm. they just don't stand a chance. With other right. technologies, whether it's CSAM or, for example, a uh, computer virus, they don't have to be experts. They don't have to tell ransomware or an APT. They just know that their email provider will actually block it for them. We're looking for the bare minimum there, which is just letting us know that maybe something might be fake and then allowing us to decide maybe we don't want to see it, maybe it won't go viral. But right now, the things that are most extreme go the most viral. Mm -hmm. and the platforms that do think about this are already solving that using technology like ours. Right. Very good. And I do want to note that drafting this bill, uh, the deepfake bill, wasn't easy. We had to look at allowing satire, right, mm -hmm. and all these kinds of things within the framework of the Constitution and having uh, Democratic and Republican lawyers look at this uh, to figure out what gave us a chance. I just think if the platforms mm -hmm. um, can point to something as opposed to laws that aren't quite on point, mm -hmm. uh, which 11 states have done for states, but not for federal, and say, we, we've got to take this down. Um, we're going to be in a much better place uh, than we are with the, a little label uh, that they may not even uh, notice. And it also, the labels, you know, I think it's important for some of this, but I don't think it can be the only answer. Um, um, uh, Mr. Scanlon, you know, birthplace of democracy, no kidding. Spent a little time in your state there. I know you cherish democracy very much. Um, could you um, talk about what other federal support would be helpful in taking this on in addition to stronger laws? Secretaries of State for a good decade now have been dealing with misinformation and disinformation generally. And that takes on many different forms. And there's no question that today, voters receive their news in different formats than they did 20 years ago. And a lot of that news is electronic. Uh, it's on their cell phone. Uh, many voters believe exactly what they see on, uh, on that, on that uh, format, on that media, uh, without question. So in addition to whatever might be appropriate to help states recognize uh, uh, and put brakes on malicious technology in terms of deep fakes, I think we have to spend a, a, a real strong effort on the fundamentals of transparency and helping voters uh, and educating voters on the election systems and how they run and uh, what the checks and balances are that are protecting them uh, in the polling place. Right. I've always found interesting, like those Baltic states on the border with Russia, they were putting up misinformation, 
lying things. And they, over time, because of education, they kind of have seen through some of it. Um, it is possible. It can't be our only answer because of what everyone's being exposed to. But I think it's a good point. And we have the election assistance, of course, commission. But I did want to say I appreciate as a Republican Secretary of State how seriously uh, you and the Attorney General and others in New Hampshire took uh, this uh, egregious breach um, with the guy that did an interview afterward. Maybe they should have hired a mime instead of a magician. But um, in the end, I just think that uh, we've got to make clear there's consequences when this happens as well. I have other questions. I don't want to go over my um, colleagues' time. I already have about that I'll ask you on the record, Mr. Alma and Mr. Gupta. Thank you so much uh, for being witnesses today. But I just this we have to be as sophisticated as the people that are messing around with our democracy and our laws, and that's why we got to get these bills done. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Klobuchar. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, maybe this is something that uh, Secretary Scanlon can talk about. We have laws that we're contemplating passing um, in this committee as well as in the larger committee, the full committee. But where does educating the public come into play? Uh, to let them know that as we uh, are approaching or we are already in an election situation, that they should expect to experience uh, AI-created audio, video, um, fake stuff, that where does educating the public to the fact that they will be subjected to all of this come into play to uh, inoculate them against the impact of this kind of fake, deep fake material? I think the states are best suited to deliver the message. Are they to though? Their voters? Well, I, I, believe, I believe they are. And I, I believe that there is a role for the federal government to assist them in that because um, elections are run differently in every state. Yes. Um, but there is a, I mean, this issue with AI and the impact that can have, it could actually bring down an election uh, if it's done successfully. Mm -hmm. And that's a national problem. It's not a state problem. You know, the states, I think, are prepared to help deal with it. But, but the narrative has to be uniform. Well, what I'm getting at is that, you know, people in... Uh, <laughs> The use of AI, I think, is going to be very uh, prevalent in this election, upcoming election season. The voters should know that they will be subjected. They may not know it. They may not even believe that it's happening to them. Something happens, and, and then after the fact, you have a press conference, and you say, oh, there, there was a fake uh, uh, President Biden telling people not to vote. That's after the fact. How do you inform people that they should be aware are states doing this, and does that play a role? That's the question that I have, because I don't know that that is happening in, in the states. It's usually after the fact that they are informed. In New Hampshire, we're trying to raise the level of awareness of voters mm -hmm. so that they know what to expect okay. during an election cycle. I don't know that we can do any more than that. Um, some of these deep fakes can be incredibly real, and... Uh, and you know, I don't know how we, you know, how we deal with that in real time. Uh, do, uh, Mr. Co Coleman, do you have something to add? Yeah, um, you know, at Reality Defender, we we, we don't uh, sell directly to consumers. We sell to large companies, for example, large investment banks. And large investment banks um, have a, a internal challenge educating their employees, whether it's deep fakes or uh, ransomware or spam or, or different kinds of scams. And what we've seen work, and the only thing that works, is to actually you know, try and scam the employees, obviously teach them what's happening, and let them look back and see what happened. An example with phishing email campaigns, um, one of the most standard tools to educate employees about phishing campaigns is to actually send them phishing campaigns, uh -huh. and then afterwards ask them if they thought it was real or fake, and do it over a continuous basis, over weeks and months. Um, and I would imagine, you know, I can't speak to whether it's state or federal. Uh, that's your, your world, not mine. But I can imagine, given that we're all talking about cybersecurity, uh, education, hygiene, a very similar approach could work uh, on a very large level. I do think it's worth pointing out that deepfakes, image, audio, video, this is a new paradigm, right? It's a new reality. 
Uh, there is evidence from the University of uh, Maryland uh, School of Public Policy that when voters are informed about what policy looks like, there is wide bipartisan support for federal regulation. There just is, right? And I believe it's 89% support across the board. Um, and I can share that report with you if you're interested. I think one of you said that uh, it, th that there are countries, Taiwan, even China, they already have legislation to protect against the uh, use of uh, AI created deep fakes. So uh, are any of them applicable, do you think, to our country? Mr. Coleman. Uh, absolutely, you know, and, and just at a high level, you know, the majority of use cases for AI and generative media are great. They're gonna help the world do a lot of great things. They're gonna help create medicine faster, yes. solve all kinds of societal issues. And this is one very small issue that has very large asymmetric uh, penalties, uh, as they say. And so what we're seeing in other countries, whether it's uh, in, 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 in Taiwan, Singapore, Japan, even China, but also UK, uh, European Commission, Canada, is the first step is the bare minimum is just indicating that something may be fake. Not saying they're blocking it or flagging it or damaging the user, but just saying it may be. And you know, I, I, full disclosure, I'm a Google alum, but Google has taken an interesting approach of one now requiring uploaders to confirm whether or not they're generative media. And if you don't confirm it and it's later found out, you might lose your account. And so certain platforms, certain organizations are thinking long term about this and saying it's gonna happen anyways. It's already working in other parts of the world, it might work here as well. It is a stepwise approach along with education, which I think you're mentioning with the Secretary of State as well. But uh, I think there are certain stepwise uh, approaches that are absolutely applicable here in a year where elections are gonna be um, paramount. I think that, that these platforms will start paying a lot more attention to the content on their platforms if we start to move toward eliminating Section 230 liability protections. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Horner. Senator Whitehouse. Thanks, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to find out from uh, each one of you if you think that there is a particularly good source, like, for instance, New Hampshire's Attorney General, or a particularly good article or analysis on where gaps are in the criminal law that should be plugged in order to deal with the problem of deliberate and malicious AI uh, fakery? Do fraud laws need to be adjusted? Does it need to become a RICO predicate? What are the, and I don't know, go ahead, Mr. Gupta, but also um, I'd like to hear from any of you, if you're not the expert, but you have somebody you know or admire or think does good work in this space, if you could let us know, because we're trying yeah, to... Yeah, definitely. Again, this report from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy by Stephen Call, it's really in-depth, and it talks about what the people think should be done, right? They actually take time to educate the people about certain policies yeah. and then poll them about should there be an independent federal organization? What kind of laws should exist? How extreme should those laws be? Yeah. I'm not the expert. Legislators are the expert, but I fundamentally believe that legislators should be informed by the public's opinion. And so I would highly report recommend that. would be one good place to look. Yeah. Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Senator. Um, so I, I believe New Hampshire is probably the first state relative to uh, elections where the Attorney General is investigating and hopefully prosecuting uh, the individuals responsible for yeah. the deep fake. And I think that it's, it's probably gonna take that exercise and that experience to figure out where the gaps are. Yeah. And I'd be happy to report that to you when they complete that. That would be great. And if you don't mind, when you get home to your Granite State, let them know that we were asking about uh, the Attorney General and if they could let us know or have their policy person uh, check in, that would be helpful. Mr. Coleman. Uh, on the topic that Ranking Member Holly mentioned, particularly around deepfake, uh, non-permissioned or non-consensual pornography, um, what we've seen time and time again is that um, students, young men, um, are creating deepfake imagery of women in their classes. And what's double challenging here is that while it might break rules within the schools, it's not breaking any local laws. Yep. And so the challenge of this potential patchwork of laws, which doesn't exist in most states, where they're committing an issue, they'll get suspended from their school, they won't be arrested. So this is an area that can follow other types of emerging regulations and also penalties around CSAM imagery 
because I would argue that any image that's of an underage person that's nude uh, definitely is effectively CSAM, whether it's real or fake. Um, I could perhaps just add a, a couple. Of, I think these are all great points. Um, uh, I think we could probably look back to 1999, 1998, when the internet was really young. We had, you know, piracy is, is, is follow a very similar path. If you try uploading an NFL video on YouTube, it won't make it past the upload screen today. Um, that is because there is watermarking technology that, that is broadcasted. Um, so uh, there's also very strict penalties. Uh, piracy law makes it very strict in terms of if you proliferate, if you upload pirate, pirated data, there are consequences. Uh, there are letters sent to your home. Um, so I, I think like, we've solved some of these issues in the past already. Um, you know, the folks who, who are doing like, the, the trust and safety work at YouTube have probably been dealing with a lot of this stuff, non-AI generated, but still like, you know, flipped images, mirrored images, et cetera. Uh, altered uh, forms of the same material being uploaded. So um, I think th this is, we could take a lot of inspiration from there. One more thing, Senator. I, I think it's really important that the United States military, the intelligence communities, are funded properly to help integrate this technology. Because if the US government doesn't know what's real and what's fake, then we have a really big problem. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Senator White House. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask. And some thanks more for questions. being patient with our schedule today. We had a I group of visitors that. from the House who had something to deliver. Very well said. Uh, I'm, I have a few more questions, and I apologize for the lateness of the hour, so I'm going to try to be quick in my questions. Mr. Ahmed, I think you had a comment on my question, if you can't can't remember it, you are more than forgiven, and I want to prompt you with another question along the same lines. Uh, we were discussing watermarking. The point was made that this labeling watermarking was insufficient in and of itself. The idea of an independent entity would be not necessarily only to set a licensing regime, but also establish something more than just simplistic watermarking, as all of you have suggested. Uh, you actually um, use voice, cl voice cloning software. Uh, the voice cloning software, incidentally, from New Hampshire, I understand, was from a company known as Eleven Labs, or uh, it was created using software from Eleven Labs. Uh, most of these voice cloning tools don't require the consent of the person being impersonated. You suggested earlier, I think, uh, the idea of a public database, um, traceability. Could you expand on, on that point? Because it seems to me we've been talking about essentially defensive measures of a very simplistic kind. If we can use the technology to flip the model, so to speak, if there is technology that can be used to apprehend and, and trace the bad guys, uh, that might be a strong deterrent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's exactly how we're thinking about watermarking. And, you know, and, and to, to the earlier point, like the watermarking that we're talking about here is imperceptible. It's inaudible. It's a deeply sophisticated. It's a neural network that's embedding watermark. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult to replace or remove these watermarks. Um, I think you know, we, uh, this kind of indirectly kind of answers a bunch of questions and topics today. Um, I think we need to hold a lot of generative companies accountable. You know, it shouldn't be the case where someone can go in and as unsophisticated as uh, these attacks are at the moment, they're largely there because they're not even writing code. They're actually going to online websites, sometimes even to the Apple's app store, downloading an app and effectively doing something there. So I think, you know, we could start at like the, the generative models modeling perspective there. Um, I think the idea of traceability is extremely important. Um, you know, you have the, the last, the world that we don't want to live in is a world where everyone just shuts down creates their data lake and says, this is our data, no one else can touch it, no one else can access this data, right? And you're already seeing that with Reddit, you're seeing that with Twitter, where the API access is being shut down. You have other uh, you know, uh, companies that rely on that data to, to suffer. Um, so um, I, I think the, the twofold answer to your question, one, the generative uh, models 
uh, if we can create some sort of a watermark, and there's tons of research we're doing this area, in this area where a subset of the data, even if it's watermarked, uh, the watermark persists through model training, shows up on the other side, you can see like, oh, this was created with this source of audio, right? Um, and I think that's extremely important. The second is this idea of this public database. I think a lot of this does come to education. Um, you know, when I was in school, <laughs> you were told how to use the internet. You were told how to chat online, you were told where to go. Um, I think the world has like significantly changed. I think people like kids, uh, adults, etc., uh, people who work in enterprises need a place and a source where they can look at vulnerabilities. Um, and I think you know, as you grow up, uh, you know, I, I went, I studied computer science. Uh, in our forensics class, we would look at like reports that Google, Apple would publish as like incident reports and try to analyze them. Um, I, I think a, a public database of all incidents. Uh, that is very easy to find, neatly categorized, serves as good educational material, trying to d uh, demonstrate how attacks were created, uh, and that, that um, basically can, can be a great resource for, for education, but also a great resource for uh, understanding you know, where, these, um, where the gaps are in terms of holding these generative companies accountable um, and making sure that they're not that easy to access. access. I would like to just commend that statement and also let you know that that currently exists with the DARPA AI force. Like that, the DARPA is working on that exact idea, and I think it is a great idea. Thank you. Mr. Coleman? I think everything they're describing is a fantastic start, but presupposes that, again, everyone's going to follow the same rules. You know, whether it's downloading open source software or a, a state level actor using software that does not follow the rules or has hacked the rules. Best case is you have a watermark or a cryptographic hash that's wrong, that gives a false sense of security. And worst case, you don't have anything at all because the bad actor doesn't care about the rules and doesn't follow them. And so our focus is on the probabilistic view that doesn't need any watermarks. Um, and I think this is a world where we could all work together, but I just want to share that there's two sides of the same coin. Yeah, I'm assuming that no one follows the rules voluntarily. Yeah. I do think, I, really, it's more about that Swiss cheese model, if you're familiar with that, right? That you have all of these different things in place, and the stuff's going to fall through the holes. And deep fake detection companies like ours, we are good at deep fake detection, right? We have really high quality accuracy. We present heat maps and information and probability scores, and all of that's delivered to big tech companies at scale, militaries at scale. Like, that's what we do, right? But that's not enough. By itself is not enough. You need everything. You need some kind yeah. of punishment when people fail to follow the rules. That too. And you need to know what's real and fake, right? This is counterfeit truth, and like we have counterfeit currency, right? Well, you need to be able to know <clears throat> and to prove. And punish. Yeah. M Mr. Just Chairman. Prove just as you would in counterfeiting, just mm -hmm. as you would. Right. Somebody's speeding. We don't assume that everyone's going to follow the mm -hmm. speed limits. You need police with radar detectors. Yeah, right. But yes. But I think beyond all of this, these are all fantastic ideas that at some level we'll all solve for. But I think we can all agree we need to start somewhere. We need to start somewhere with baby steps. We can start adding additional things, but we still haven't started yet. And we're months away from an election year. Uh, well, you have just crystallized yeah. or <laughs> expressed the anxiety that yeah. many of us feel because we are approaching the election. As I mentioned at the very outset, we're facing a deluge of this stuff. Yeah. And by the way, it's not the first time that we face distorted electioneering or fake ads. When I first started out, our great fear was on the Sunday before elections, someone would go around with mimeographed pieces of paper and put them on the windshields of cars parked at church without identifying who it was from, but distorted images of the candidate doing something terrible. So the idea, and you know, you go back to the founders, they were worried about false electioneering as well as Secretary of the State. In New Hampshire, you have a concern with making sure that elections are fair and, and honest this problem didn't just arise, but you're absolutely right. We're facing an election where we need to take some steps right away. I'm not going to say they're baby steps, but steps 
right away. I, I would like to caution us against taking, like adopting the Chinese model approach. There's a really great book by a Columbia Law professor, Dr. Bradford, where she outlines the Chinese state-driven approach, the European rights-driven approach, and the historical United States market-driven approach. So something needs to be done, but a state-driven approach has serious and significant harms to the public. And I want to caution us against adopting regulation that China has put in, in place. Let me um, kind of come back to one of the key questions. And I mentioned earlier that my belief, Senator Hawley agrees, that Section 230 does not apply to AI. And therefore, we have a legal basis to hold big tech accountable here. To what extent does big tech know or should it know that these kinds of con artists are using their platforms? I can say that we are currently engaged with the big tech companies. The big tech companies are deploying our technology to fight against deep fake misinformation already. That's already happening. Well, they're not doing a very good job. Yeah, I, I know. They need to use it more. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd say some large tech companies are thinking long-term about this. Um, others of them, without naming any specifics, have completely decimated their teams that are focused on trust and safety and have cut their budgets on actually using software from any of us. Um, a lot of this is public. It's all in, you know, it, the, yeah. I, I'm, I'm guessing from what I've read publicly that one of the companies that have cut their staffs is Meta. I, I, I won't comment on that, but, uh, but I will say that every one of them needs to expand these teams. They need to see them as a, uh, uh, a expected requirement from government and not a cost function, because we've seen the most recent layoffs. These are the first teams to go. And not just 10 or 20% of the teams, we're talking about the whole teams. Everybody in trust and safety, everybody in identity KYC, everybody in fraud, completely gutted. You know, this, uh, there are many, many great startups. So, you know, I feel really small sometimes. Um, and I share the frustration because we're building the technology. And, you know, for a while we, you know, tried to get it to the platforms. And, and we realized the elections are like, you know, months, a year, when we, years when we started, months now at this point. And um, this is one of the reasons why we kind of skipped the line. We said, okay, you know what, like the consumers, they need a tool that they can access today. Um, we need to give them a way to get to the tool themselves. This is exactly where we are right now is 1998. GeoCities was like, you know, people are building websites in GeoCities and they're shipping them. And there's malware, there's spyware, there's all sorts of stuff. We're not at the point where we can expect a browser to pop up a red screen. That happened in the mid 2010s, right? Like that's very recent news. But for a long time, we lived on the internet and it was still uh, very early days. And so our, our goal and, you know, what we've shifted our focus towards is providing a tool that anyone can access, not just for enterprise, not just for you know the, the companies that are out there, but for normal consumers that they can go and they can validate against like YouTube videos, TikTok, Twitter, TikTok, et cetera. They can go all over the place and try to validate that. And our goal is trying to get this technology ourselves as much as we can do to the consumer as quickly as we can. Um, yeah. I am, oh. I am taking from these answers that the social media companies know or should know because what you have said basically, whether it's cutting their teams or using your software or inventing technology that can trace the deep fakes that they know they have the capacity they know or they should know when their platforms are being misused one more quick thing here i you know the th i want to highlight that issue of scale right the firing of the trust and safety teams is a tragedy it is but the amount of deep fakes and the amount of misinformation is not going to be solved by hiring those teams back. They would have to hire 10, 20 times more people. AI must be fought with AI. And for every deep fake you see on the platform, there are hundreds more that were removed and not submitted because they were filtered out. Thank you. Um, you may recall the devastating wildfires that spread across Hawaii, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Chinese Communist Party decided to spread the disinformation that the disaster was the result of a United States weather weapon test, as it was called, weather weapon. This conspiracy theory showed Beijing's willingness to directly meddle in American affairs. I'm sure there have been others, but it was supported by AI 
generated images. Uh, maybe you can talk about some of the dangers to the United States from our foreign adversaries, not just within the country like the New Hampshire mm -hmm. primary person. Yeah, I'll give a very uh, a vivid example. Um, a few months ago, there was shown online um, on, on, on X on Twitter um, what looked like an explosion of the Pentagon. And, you know, part of the reason, because there's no regulations to automatically scan for it on upload, um, it took millions of shares and reshares for it to be flagged by community notes. By that time, it led to a $100 billion flash crash in the market. Now, the market did come back, but this is a really simple image, which arguably was a diffusion-based deepfake. Um, we detected it with doing what's called frequency domain analysis, but this is an example of how you can uh, not only move an election, but also move markets with a single photo correctly placed on the right social media platform and then just letting it go viral on its own. I would like to highlight the difference between misinformation through a telecom, like the Biden robocall, and misinformation through the platforms. Those are very different things. They are operated very differently. I believe Reality Defender works very closely with financial services and telecoms to solve that problem. Deep Media works very closely with the platforms to solve that problem. We also work very closely with the Air Force Cyber Command Division, 16th Air Force Unit, as well as NASIC, as well as the US Army, to fight foreign interference from a military standpoint. So while in the interest of national security, I would like to not go into specifics. We are monitoring for uh, Chinese and other near-peer adversary deep fake-based misinformation and narrative redirection campaigns. Um, let me conclude my questions uh, by going to Mr. Scanlon. You uh, mentioned um, the possibility that AI could be used to, quote, bring down an election, end quote. Uh, maybe you could expand on that point. What's, what's most important in the election process is that the voters have confidence in the outcome and the results of an election. And as long as they are confident, they are going to participate. And New Hampshire and, and Minnesota consistently are among states where we have very high voter participation. But if voters start believing that the government is corrupt or the, the election outcomes are not accurate, uh, they've been manipulated somehow, then participation is going to decline. And it only takes one really serious event where an election at least has the appearance of having a major breakdown in terms of the outcome, to throw doubt uh, in the voting population. And I think that's a really, really significant concern. Um, you know, that is probably the, the most fundamental important thing that I perceive in my role as Secretary of State is to make sure that an election is not messed up, that, you know, the voters believe and, and know that it was run fairly and accurately uh, to the highest standards possible. And if we lose that, uh, it, it will be very, very hard to get it back. Thank you. Uh, I'll open it to any final comments that anyone may have, if you haven't had an opportunity to say something. Um, no, I, I think, uh, you know, I'll echo the point, confidence is, uh, voter confidence is so key. Uh, you know, we, um, again, we have a list of these attacks that occur in other places in, in politics, et cetera. One to point out is actually in, in uh, uh, the, the British op opposition leader, Sir Kiermer, uh, Keir Starmer, um, was, you know, there's a deep fake of him berating his, his staff, right? Um, that gives an impression uh, to voters that is not correct. You know, it's it's not fair to him, um, and you know, overall, like once once like you know what uh, my colleague said earlier, uh, when everything in the world uh, is, is fake, you don't know what's real anymore, and I think that's extremely important. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add and reiterate that I don't think any single solution is ever 100 percent, and the opportunity that exists with developing the world's best technology can also apply here as well. 
I'm so really excited for the collaboration among startups and big companies, but also our elected officials in solving this very important issue. Thank you. I would like to highlight two things. Um, I definitely agree with Ben that no single solution works. I believe the defense in depth solution provides a comprehensive way forward. I also want to highlight that, again, there are frameworks for legislation. There's the state-driven approach with China, the rights-driven approach with the European Union, and the market-driven approach with the United States. A market-driven approach is good for the generative AI companies and the platforms, and it's good for the U.S. people. It is not dissimilar to the pro uh, proposed legislation that you've put in place. I actually think that solves a lot of these problems. Uh, but to me, it's about internalizing these negative externalities so the AI ecosystem can grow safely, largely, quickly, and we can all get rich. <laughs> Mr. Scanlon, uh, Secretary of State, uh, you, your synopsis or your summary of the dangers here I thought was very eloquent and powerful, but um, uh, I know you're on the firing line Literally every election, every time people go to the polls, that issue of trust and credibility is there. And uh, it relates not only to those of us who are candidates, but anybody who goes to the polls and wants to have confidence that the outcome is going to have integrity. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you all. Uh, this was an excellent and very informative and helpful session. Again, my apologies for the lateness. and. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. The record will stay open for a week in case my colleagues have additional questions for you in writing. And uh, the hearing is adjourned.